Beth at Paris House Wool Works, and this tutorial is going to be about two common types of rug binding. Um, one is twill tape binding, and the other is yarn whip stitch. So you will see these techniques on hooked rugs quite frequently. Um, the first one is twill tape, and I use twill tape binding on a piece when I don't want to see a visual frame around the piece as part of the binding. So this particular piece, I wanted to just kind of run off the edge visually. I didn't want to have a, a frame on it. So I used twill tape. So the twill tape functions to cover the edge of the piece and protect it and um, hide the foundation. So when you look at a twill tape bound piece, you do not want to see any foundation peeking through. And I'm going to show you how to achieve that with twill tape binding. Um, the other technique I'm going to show you real quick is yarn whip stitch. So yarn whip stitch does create a really nice frame around the edge. And um, sometimes that can be really pretty. And you can pick either a contrasting uh, yarn or a yarn that kind of matches the background more. So these are the two things that I'm going to show you. I also wanted to make a note that this is a hooked pillow and the back of the pillow, the backing wool, was attached using the same stitch that I'm going to show you for the twill tape binding. Uh, we have a very popular video on how to finish hook pillows that uses this stitch, but I think you're going to get a better idea of exactly how that stitch is done from this video. So these are two videos that could possibly be helpful hand in hand if you're finishing a hooked pillow in this very simple way. All right, so today, I am starting to put a twill tape binding on this piece. And just a note about twill tape, it's, it's cotton. It comes in rolls. It comes in a lot of different colors. Uh, the color you choose for your piece is not super important because it is invisible from the front. But it is nice to have something that sort of coordinates with the piece. Um, we have these at Paris House Woolworks in a variety of colors, um, and you can also buy them at other hooking supply stores as well. Um, so I'm gonna point the camera down so that you can see how this is gonna work. When you're measuring out your twill tape binding, you can do it uh, a couple of different ways. You can either take the measurements of your piece and do um, just the addition uh, and, and come up with a perimeter number and then add a few inches to that so that you have plenty of extra. Or you can literally take a uh, tool tape and just run it around the perimeter and make an estimate. You do want to have extra because it's better to have extra than it is to, you know, go all the way around and end up with something that's gapping like this at the end. That can be very awkward if that happens. So tool tape binding is very inexpensive. At the time of this video, we charge $1.25 a yard for ours, and that's retail. Um, so, you know, be generous with yourself with your twill tape. It's not going to cost a lot if you have a little extra that, that you have to cut off at the end. Um, the other thing that you want to think about is where you're going to start the binding. I never start my binding in the corner, just like I never start my hooking in the corner, because I don't want an edge there. And I can show you on this finished piece why that is important. So when you do a twill tape bound piece, you're going to go all the way around attaching it to the edge and you're going to miter the corners. Now, the quilters in the audience will note that my mitered corners are not super neat. I am not great at hand stitching and I am really not a quilter. <laughs> so, um, this is not the neatest mitered corner and many of you will be able to do a neater job. But my point here is, is that if you tried to do this with two cut ends instead of the tape 
rounding that corner, it could be um, very difficult. So that's why we don't start in the corners. Um, I want to also show you while I have this piece out like this, that what I'm going to show you today is how to get this attachment on here. And you're going to go all the way around with it. The next step, if we were to work all the way to the finish, is once that is all attached on the outside, the, peak, the tape is folded over and then just a very, uh, an overhand stitch like this, just to tack it down. And then from there, I press the piece again to make sure that it lays nice and flat. So I just I do it the same way that I would do uh, steaming and blocking. I actually put a damp cloth over it once this is tacked down, and I just steam around the edges to flatten the binding tape. The other thing you'll notice here is this is, this is the way I do um, the end where they come together. I just fold this under a little bit and then do the, the tacking down here. I have seen more sophisticated ways of making this join. This is the way I do it, but I would encourage you to, you know, certainly use your own way of doing it. Some people like to angle this attachment and that's fine too. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. I, I tend to keep it really simple on mine. All right, so put that to the side. I have my matching, my matching thread for my tool tape. You're going to want your thread to match because your stitches will show just a little bit. Um, and so you want, you want to make sure that they're going to match. So notice that I have my piece top side up. I'm not working from the back. I have the piece top side up and I am going to, I would normally start, to be honest, I would normally start down here along the bottom toward the bottom edge. Um, but because I want to show you how I go around a corner, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it starting up at this top edge here so that you'll be able to see how I make the corner. Otherwise it would take too long, <laughs> too long for a little tutorial like this. All right. So I've got my, um, I've got my threaded needle, I have doubled it and knotted it at the end. It is not necessary to double it. Um, I should talk to you a little bit about thread. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that conversation. This is really important. The thread you use to bind a rug has to be super strong. This is 100% um, polyester thread. It's Coates and Clark. To be honest, my favorite thread to work with is 100% polyester Guterman thread. Um, but this will work too. What you don't want is a cotton thread that is perfectly fine for running through a sewing machine, but will break if it's on the other end of a hand needle and you're pulling really hard because part of what achieves that coverage, um, of the foundation is that we are pulling really tightly as we make these stitches so that we can really cover the edge of the foundation on the piece. So super important to have a strong, sturdy thread that's not gonna break. If you need to double it to really guarantee that's not gonna happen, by all means, double it. Um, I've worked with um, threads, you know, here in Maine, we have a, we have a long history of uh, shoe and textile factories. And every once in a while in a second hand or a thrift shop, I will actually find an old spool of shoe thread. And it, as long as it's not the super thick sh shoe thread, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> it will work beautifully and that stuff never breaks. So be on the lookout for those kinds of things too, like old industrial spools of polyester thread are really good. Okay, so we'll go back uh, now that we've had thread chat. <laughs> We'll go back to the stitching. Okay, so I'm gonna start up here. I'm gonna put my thread aside and I'm just gonna get to where my knot is. And I am gonna come up between two of my loops. And hopefully the thread will catch. Sometimes it doesn't the first time, but we got lucky and it did. All right. 
And what I'm going to do, I'm working from the top side, is I'm, I'm between two loops right here. I'm going to put a little stitch, maybe an eighth of an inch in to the tape. And then I'm going to come back up between those two loops. Now, sometimes your thread is going to want to catch your loop. So that's something you have to be careful of. And I'm pulling really tightly right there. So now I have my first stitch. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the needle and I'm going to go underneath two loops and come back up in between these two. And I'm not right at the edge. I'm, I'm kind of centered at the, the needles coming up. And I'm pulling tightly again. So the needle came up between those next two loops. I'm going to go back under, catch the binding tape, maybe, maybe a sixth, nah, it's not even an eighth, maybe a sixteenth of an inch in. I'm going to pull it tight. My thread knotted on me a little bit there. That's the other thing. Use a thread that, this is why the Guterman's a little bit better. Use a thread that doesn't easily twist or knot on you. This is gonna be fine because it's just gonna hide down into the loops, but that can happen. Another way to prevent that is to use beeswax on your thread. That'll help as well. I did not do that. All right. And I'm gonna go back under. All right, just to fix that, that stitch. And now I'm gonna go under two, and now I'm gonna kinda just get into the rhythm of it so you can see it. Make a stitch. Come back up, go under two. Pull tight, always pull tight. Make a stitch. Come back up under two. If it gets caught around your loops, just kind of get it uncaught. And I'm just going to keep doing this until I get up around the corner so you can see what I do there. So I'm making a stitch under two, making a stitch. That's the pattern. This is not going to be the neatest job I've ever done because I'm trying to do it so that you can see more than so that I can see. <laughs> This piece was hooked in size five. And so the stitches are going to be a little closer together than if this were a chunky piece. But it's the same principle regardless of whether you've got a nice big primitive size eight or more, or even a little tiny size three. So I'm coming up on coming up on my corner of my attachment here, making my stitch. Now that I'm pretty close to this corner, just to make the corner a little bit more secure. I'm going to start, I'll, I'll go under another two. Now I'll start here. I'm going to go under each one 
at the corner. Because I want it to be really well attached at this corner. And now as I'm turning this corner, I need to just make sure that, see how that, that forms almost like a box lid? I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going each one so that that turn ends up nice and clean without a lot of gapping or anything like that. And it is, you know, you do kind of feel at this point like a third hand might be handy, but we don't have that. So just keep going with your, with your, you know, under, make a stitch. And then go under again. So I'm turning this whole thing just so you can see how the corner develops. I'm going under that corner loop. And now I'm gonna tack it down right there. Now I'm going to go under one because I'm still at the corner. Some of you might want to use a thimble. My father is actually um, a, a first generation Italian tailor and he would castigate me for not using a thimble. <laughs> but unfortunately I do not have my father's or my immigrant grandfather's tailoring skills. Um, so now that I'm around the corner, I'm going to resume going under two loops and making my stitch. And I'll just do one or two more and then I'll show you what this looks like. And like I said, this is not as neat as my normal binding because I'm trying to make sure that it's, it's visible to you, but that's okay. This is a piece for my own collection. All right, so I would just continue that way around. Um, I'm just gonna actually pop this needle through here so that it's not loose, but you can see when I turn that, the linen is completely covered. And as I go around the corner, it's completely covered. And that's what we want to see. Now, if I were to flip this over, you can see how it looks. It looks almost like a box lid upside down. And so, Assuming all of this was attached and I had come all the way around the other side, what would happen then is this corner could be, you know, neatly mitered like this. And then this edge, this inner edge, after you fold it down, that's what gets tacked down with just an overhand stitch. You're just like stitch, 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 stitch around and around to tack it down. It's going to look, again, just to refresh your memory, it's going to look like this. Then you're going to, as I said, you're going to press it. And that's going to be it. It's very easy, as I said, that that stitch under two, stitch under two with one at the, each corner going one alternating at each corner. That is exactly how you do the pillows as well. So we are ready to move on to the yarn whip stitching. So this is what yarn whip stitching looks. 
like, and you may prefer this because this is a whole lot simpler than what I just showed you. What I just showed you is pretty simple once you get into the rhythm of it. I know for a lot of people it feels, um, especially people who don't hand sew, which I was when I came to rug hooking, um, it, it might feel a little intimidating. Uh, if that feels intimidating and you're new and you don't want to get into that just yet, this is a beautiful, beautiful finish for a hooked rug. So what we're going to work on today is my little purple queen bee. <laughs> we're going to put a nice yarn whip stitch on the queen bee. And um, if anybody really loves this pattern, uh, this is available exclusively through Darn Good Yarn. We do uh, kits uh, in exclusive designs for Darn Good Yarn at darngoodyarn.com. And this is one of the ones that we did for them. So that's where the queen bee is available if you like this pattern. Um, oh, and just for, just for information, um, this pattern is available on our website, um, as are all the other patterns that you've seen in this video. But this one, this one is darn good yarn. So what we're going to do, this is super easy. Uh, get a yarn that is either somewhat matching. In the case of the Queen Bee, I chose something that, that is uh, pretty much a match, very similar. Um, or, you know, like with the peace sign, you can do something that's a contrast. It's just totally up to you. It's aesthetic. There's no right or wrong. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut a length of this yarn. The yarn can be wool. Uh, the yarn can be um, acrylic. It can be whatever it is. I have also bound, uh, I've done um, this kind of whip stitch binding uh, with Sari Silk. Uh, I have a friend who uses, um, very frequently uses um, wool strip. You can do it with that. Uh, anything that your imagination comes up with. If the rug is for the floor, I tend to like to stay with wool because I think it's very, very durable. And then I do have a friend uh, who's wonderful and she kind of does a belt and suspenders approach. She will actually catch uh, twill tape as she's doing a whip stitch binding so that not only is it whip stitched, it's twill tape bound as well. Uh, that's a whole other thing that you can try if you'd like to. Uh, but typically the back of a whip stitched piece looks like this. So, um, you know, you just see the whip stitching, but in the case of adding twill tape and catching it with every iteration, this would also have twill tape on the back. All right. So I am using a, what I call a tapestry needle. These are, um, often available at your local yarn stores. And these are used for sewing in ends with knitting. A lot of you will be familiar with this big chunky needle. And I am going to thread this needle. You'll notice in some videos I'm wearing my contact lenses, but if I'm doing any close work like this, that would be a disaster. <laughs> so I have my good old trifocals on now. I do recommend when you're doing, especially the twill tape binding, and especially if you're of a certain age like I am, uh, really good light, um, you know, your reading glasses, your magnifiers, whatever it takes uh, to, so that you can see your best. Um, okay, so we're gonna start, we're gonna start uh, whip stitching this, this queen bee. All right. So again, lots of different ways to do this. Um, I have friends in rug hooking who do it from the reverse side and, and go up and around this way. That's not the way I do it. Um, but there is no right or wrong. However, this works for you is fine. Um, I like to whip stitch right to left. And what I do is I kind of roll, that's the other thing. Some of my friends roll the linen or foundation forward. They, they roll the edge forward like this. I roll the edge back. Again, it doesn't matter. But you know what does matter, and I should address it in this video. 
when your piece is finished before you bind it, it needs to be so the, all the excess, that three or four inches of foundation needs to be surged or zigzagged off and then cut so that you don't have three or four inches sticking out and, and you're contending with that while you're trying to put a binding on. That probably goes without saying, but it just occurred to me to mention that to you. All right, so I'm gonna start stitching um, in this direction. I'm going to lay the end, I do it like this, I fold back and I lay the end in that fold so that it gets caught up. Again, I don't want to start at a corner, I should probably go down here so you can see me start to make the corner on this. I'm just going to fold that end in there and hold it for the first stitch. And I'm going to come up, again, I'm coming up right on the edge of my piece. And I'm, I'm holding that tail so that it gets caught up in here so that I don't have any knots on the back. And now I'm going to come back up again along the edge of the piece. And I'm going to make my first little, you can see that on there. And now I'm going to go in right next close to it, really, really close so that I can lay that second piece of yarn down. Again, it's a little awkward for me to show the camera. I'm going to lay that next one right next to the first one. And I'm just going to keep doing that. I'm just going to keep going around and around. Let me see if I can get a better position here for myself. In this case, you don't want to go between the loops, which is what I just accidentally did, but we're going to move on anyway. You want to be just on the edge and covering up your linen. And laying those in more or less next to each other. This goes faster when you are positioned properly and not for a camera. <laughs> and this can be a very meditative activity. This can actually be almost as meditative as the hooking itself. And that's why I actually really enjoy whip stitch binding. I don't, I don't love other types of needle and thread binding. I don't love doing that. Um, but whip stitch binding, I really do enjoy doing. If you are someone who really just doesn't want to finish your pieces yourself, although I encourage you to, I think it's part of the skill set of the craft. Um, I know someone in Oxford, Maine, very near where I live in Paris, who is absolutely wonderful at finishing rugs and takes that work in and she will finish your rug very very beautifully so just get in touch with me if you want to know more information about that so i'm just as you can see just going around and around and of course there is a corner up here we have a corner coming and corners are a little bit challenging with whip stitching at first. And I'll just whip stitch a little more. I don't want this video to get real long on us. Oh. 
Also, I'm using a relatively thin thread here. This is just like kind of a worsted weight yarn. I should say yarn, not thread. Um, the thicker the material that you're working with, of course, the faster this is going to go. Um, And again, not my neatest job, just because I'm trying to work to the camera and work quickly. You can see that's covering. So I'm getting to a point here where I'm going to start folding this corner like this. And I'm going to hold it. Again, another thing in rug hooking where it would be helpful to have a third hand, kind of like hoop hooking. But I'm holding that together so that as I approach the corner, I can make sure that I really cover the foundation. And corners might take a little bit, you know, going over more than once. And sometimes what I do is I start um, I'll actually go over to the, I'll go from here to over here just to get that tacked down. And then I'll start working my way back to the corner. So that now my primary focus is covering this corner. You can see I have a few uh, stitches over here and a few on this side. And now I'm just going to work on covering this corner. And rather than take you through that whole process, which could take a few minutes, I mean, I'll do some of it. I'll kind of show you what it ends up looking like. I'm just going diagonally where I have to, to kind of start covering this corner. You can see the corner is getting more and more covered. So on my finished piece, the corner looks like this. And you can see the angle of the whip stitching where I angled in to cover that corner and went over multiple times on the corner so that it would stay. But then the rest of it is really just that overhand around and around and around with the stitches next to each other until the whole piece is covered. So that's it for whip stitching. Um, when I go to, to um, if I'm at the end, of the one thing you should know is if I'm at the end of this, um, I just run it underneath through the back and clip it. So there's no knots in whip stitching. There's no knots when you start because you're just weaving it in and there's no knots at the end because you can just run it under. Okay, so those are the two most common ways that I finish rugs and um, hopefully that was helpful. And so if you have any questions, put them in the comment thread. Um, you can also also always get me at info at parishousewoolworks.com. Remember that Paris has two R's in it. So info at parishousewoolworks.com um, or parishousewoolworks at gmail.com. And I will answer your questions. So hopefully this was helpful and um, I'll see you on the next video.